Hi, everyone. We begin the new year with a, a new series entitled Turn the Page, and each week we will be discussing about what we're turning the new page to. Today's message is Turn the Page to New Purpose, and our passage of Scripture today comes from Exodus. We'll be looking at the story of Moses and the burning bush, Exodus 3, 1 through 14. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro in his, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire within a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire, and it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the mystery, uh, misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the la uh, that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you that is, it is I who have sent you. And when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I answer them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent, you, has sent me to you. God bless the reading of his word, the word of God for the people of God. True purpose. John liked his new job. He just turned 20 and had started working for a local contractor building houses. He, he didn't know anything about building houses, but he embraced the opportunity to learn. Being the newbie, he was tasked with supply and material runs, generally assisting where more than two hands were needed, maintaining tools and Cleaning up at the end of the day, John wanted to make a good impression, so he did his best to keep up with the rest of the crew, and that meant jumping from one task to another with constantly shifting priorities. The work kept his mind active, and he learned all the various components and skills that were necessary to build a house. It took him a good over, it gave him a good overview of the process. And before too long, he was able to anticipate the various needs of the workers. What had seemed to be menial to many people had become a source of skill and pride for John, and he became a great asset for the contractor. After working in this capacity for a couple of years, the contractor called, it, called John to his office. John, he says, you are so valuable to me in the capacity that you're working. You've done such a great job, but, but you know, it's time for something else. And John feared that the man was about to lay him off. But instead, his boss said, you need to grow into this business, so I'm moving you over to foundation work. 
think you're up to that? Well, John hadn't even thought about this. Doing foundation work wasn't even on his radar. But his boss felt that he was capable and wanted to move him, so so be it. I welcome the opportunity, sir. I truly appreciate it. So John learned to build foundation frames, mix concrete, lay wire frames, you know, pour concrete and run the power trowel to smooth it all out. He learned how to know when the concrete was set and the frames could be removed. He went above and beyond learning about how temperature and moisture affected drying times. And John became quite skilled at laying foundations. And after a time, the contractor called him into the office again. John, you continue to amaze me with your dedication and learning and, and accomplishing new things. So I have something new for you. Are you ready for it? Well, John had to think for a moment. He was really enjoying doing the, the, the working with the concrete. But, but if the boss had something else for him to do, he would do his best. Yes, sir, what would you like for me to do? The contractor looked at him in the, in the eye and he said, this, is, this will be quite a change, but I know that you won't let me down. I'm, I'm going to have you learn carpentry. How does that sound? Well, sir, I, I really hadn't thought about it, but if you think I'm capable, I will certainly give it a go and do my best not to let you down. I know you will, John, and I look forward to watching you grow. So John learned about wood. He studied the purposes for different kinds of wood. He learned how to take measurements and how to run saws. He started by working on frameworks for the houses. And John spent time getting accustomed to having a hammer in his hand and learning about nails, screws, and all kinds of hardware and how it was used. He helped to raise roofs and install windows and doors. The smell of new wood became his best friend as his skill set expanded, and he came to understand all the various things that a carpenter did when building a house. Every morning, he looked forward to getting up and leaving for work. He learned to read blueprints and find ways to make the wood become what it needed to be. Well, as his skill set grew, the contractor would call him in and give him new assignments. And there were times when he was unable to master a skill, but was still competent. He appreciated the dedication and hard work of the craftsmen that taught him what they did and how they worked. John spent time as an electrician's helper and also a plumber's helper. And there were times when he, he helped install cabinets and appliances. He worked with tile workers, carpet layers, and painters. And the contractor would put him to work wherever he was needed. John even spent time with HVAC installers and found himself supervising some of the work. He even learned to lay brick and install ironwork and, and garage doors. And as a, a matter of fact, there certainly was no job that he hadn't worked on in some way. His supervisory role grew and so did his accomplishments. One day, the contractor called John back into his office. John, he said, you have learned so much and have come so far. The company needs you to do something different. We've grown so much as a company, and your hard work has been noticed and appreciated. Management agrees that we need to help you get your contractor's license. We will pay for you to do what is necessary to succeed in this. We need you and want you to keep doing the excellent work that you've shown us. And John was flabbergasted. Once again, he had never expected something like this. When he had started with the company, it was a job. Little did he realize that it would lead to this. Thank you so much, sir. I am humbled, and yes, of course, I will do what you're asking. So John worked hard and received his contractor's license and became a contractor for his company. And there came the day when his boss called him in once again. John... I really need something from you. Whatever I can do, sir. You know, John, I didn't know if you'd be able to do what you've managed to accomplish, and I'm so proud of all that you've done. I never intended for you to be a concrete guy, a carpenter, a plumber, or even a contractor. 
Those things you embraced because I asked you to, and you have performed beyond expectations, but those things were never your purpose. You see, I was actually looking for someone else, someone who could do something special for me, and all those skills were necessary for something, someone to accomplish what I have in mind. You see, I'm about to retire, John, and yes, you will probably receive another promotion and raise when that happens, but that's not what I'm talking about. You see, my, my wife and I have worked so very hard all of our lives through both good times and the hard times. The contractor pulled out a new set of blueprints out of his closet and laid them on the table. And the blueprints were a beautiful home set on a hill by a lake. John, I want you to build me a house. You see, you're the only one that I can trust this to. And I, and, and I can trust to do it right. I, I have provided you with the opportunities to learn all you need so that you can build this home for me. I place this project totally in your hands and I know you won't let me down. Well, you're right, sir, I won't. I am ready to get started and you will love it when you are finished. I know I will, John, I just know it. You know, so very often when we think about Moses, we think about all the great miracles that God performed through him, the, the plagues in Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, the, the water and the man in the desert, the Ten Commandments, and his leadership of the Israelites in the wilderness. And all of those things are important and certainly worth our attention and discussion. And while we know about baby Moses and a basket coming to live in Pharaoh's house and the time he murdered an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, we don't generally find those moments in, in many sermons. The story of the burning bush seems to be the jumping off point for following the life of Moses, as if anything before that wasn't really worthy of our consideration. Maybe because the early life of Moses lacks I don't know, shock and awe. But there was a reason that I told you the story that I did today. I could easily have written a story about that house that John built for his mentor. I could have told you about all the great features of the house, how warm and wonderful it was, all the pain and struggle that John went through to get it built, all the battles he had to fight with subcontractors and city authorities, I could have focused about how happy the contractor and his wife were when they finally got to move into the house and how grateful they were. I could have expounded on how John continued on his journey and became a highly sought after contractor himself. It probably would have been a good story if I had just started with John building the contractor's house and how John became a partner in the business where he worked. All those are good things that show how far John went on his journey. But that isn't the point of the story. And while Moses achieved many great things and became a hero to his people, none of it would have been possible if his early life had been different. His mother saved him from a violent death as a baby by putting him in that basket so that Pharaoh's daughter would find him. He would never have known who he was if his mother had not been allowed to nurse him and to raise him in Pharaoh's palace. He would have not have received the education that he received if he was, had not grown up among Pharaoh's children. He would never have gained his leadership skills if he had not served in Pharaoh's court. He also learned about the inner workings of Egyptian government and administration. He would not have understood the oppression of his people if he had not witnessed it with his own eyes. He would never have known how much his people resented him if he had not experienced that resentment when he faced it after, the, after he killed the Egyptian taskmaster. He learned about acceptance as he came to live among strangers after fleeing Egypt. He learned about family and responsibility from his father's-in-law, Roel and Jethro, and yes, he even learned about sheep herding. As a shepherd, he learned how to keep his flock moving in the right direction, something that would become invaluable as he managed to keep the Israelites moving forward in the desert. 
not one of those things was actually about what God purposed him for. But they became important as Moses stood near that burning bush in a deep conversation with the creator of the universe. None of those early lessons and experiences would go unused in the mission that God had made for him. Moses would have been perfectly content to remain in the household of Jethro until his death. But God didn't go through all this trouble of preparing Moses for his purpose just to be happy and content far away from his fellow Hebrews in Egypt. This plan that God had for saving his children from oppression was much bigger than Moses, even though he was to play a significant part. God knew that Moses was content. We don't even know if Moses was a practicing Jew while he was with Jethro. He was a stranger living among strangers. After all, Moses didn't know anything about what God intended for him. So our creator had to get his attention. And he did so with a burning bush that wasn't consumed, a bush that he could speak through and get Moses to listen. And when God told Moses what he wanted him to do, Moses could have said no. As a matter of fact, he tried to. Exodus 3.11 reads this way. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? <clears throat> I'm a nobody, God. Look at me. I'm out here tending sheep for my father-in-law. I've been in the palace of of the Pharaoh, and I've seen its magnificent walls. I don't belong there. As a matter of fact, Pharaoh will probably kill me if I showed up there. I'm pretty sure the Egyptians haven't forgotten that I killed one of their own. I, I don't really have the chops for this. And even if they don't kill me, why would they listen to me, a renegade sheep herder living among strangers and talking to the Israelites won't be any easier they resented me for being raised in the palace. They felt like I was a traitor to them then, and they will think of me as a traitor now. <clears throat> so I go, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me. And they say, they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Should I say, hey guys, remember me? You know, the Hebrew that killed the Egyptian and ran away? I'm here because God sent me. I'm, I'm here to save you. You're going to have to help me out here, God with no name. They never saw me as a religious leader, and now I seem to be representing God. So I ask you, God, who should I tell him you are? Who can I say sent me? I don't even know your name. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are say to the, the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I am has sent me to you. I am gave me this task. I am told me to say these things. I am has sent me to deliver you and your children out of the hands of Pharaoh. I am did not ask me to come here. I am told me to come here. I am has given me this new purpose. God prepares us for the purpose that he has for us. And some of those lessons and events can be small and not seem like much to us at the time that they occur. And other lessons and events may be extremely painful and difficult and hard and could be accomplished, uh, could include great losses in our life. But, but each and everything that God places in our path is meant to build in us the character and skills that God gives us to serve his purpose for us. We may not know what that purpose is, but we may find it early in life. We may not discover it either until the ends of our lives. The, th the things that we think are our purpose may be only lead in to what our purpose actually is. They may be preparations for what is to come. I will tell you that it's also possible that we can go our whole lives without discovering the purpose that God has for us, only to learn from him what it was when we arrive in heaven. 
We may serve our purpose without realizing we have done what was needed and what God prepared for us to do. God is not looking for our input into our purpose. We are called to serve, I am, in whatever he chooses for us to serve. Jesus speaks some hard to hear words in Matthew 10, 37 through 39. Most of us want to skip over these words and land on something a little more pleasant. But Christianity is not a buffet where we can just take what we want and leave the rest. So listen closely to these words from Matthew. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. I talk to so many people that just put Jesus in a box. I am totally sold out to Jesus, they say. He would never ask me to move away from my children or grandchildren. He would never ask me to change professions. He would never ask me to do anything dangerous or humiliating. I hate to tell you this, but that is not being sold out to Jesus. God gives us the ability to say no to him, but we can't do that and still get his blessing. God has to be number one in our lives above all else. That also means that it cannot be just lip service. This week, as we face the new year, let us examine our lives and see if God really is number one. Are we listening to God and moving in the direction he has planned for us? Or, or are we defining our purpose for God ourselves? Are we putting on blinders and saying, God, I'm going in this direction, so you can use me as long as I'm going this way? Or are we actually letting God determine our paths? Let us lay down our personal purpose at his feet and take up the yoke that he offers us. Let us examine the groundwork he has laid out in our lives and listen to his voice as he guides us to the purpose for which he created and nurtured us. God bless you all. Amen. Mm -hmm.